Is this shows? alarm in the background going to be okay? <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit of like Does that mean we should get out? Sound installation happening. <laughs> Do you think that's a building-wide noise? No, no one else. Like, there's people chilling over there, and, and they, they don't look concerned. I don't smell smoke. The Barbican Centre, it turns out, was not on fire, um, but Holly Herndon and I still got out of there. We went back to her hotel to record this episode of Midnight Chats in a very unlikely place. We sat on a little landing just by the lifts on floor three of her hotel, which meant that anyone coming up to floor three, the lift would open and they would be faced with myself and Holly sat on a small bench talking into our microphones. Quite a bizarre welcome to some people who had maybe just arrived in London for their holiday. But thank you to Holly for putting up with this kind of slapdash, unprofessional outfit that we're running here at Loud and Quiet. I met Holly earlier this year. We did um, a big cover feature with her about her new album called Proto. And there's a lot for me to tell you about that before we get started on this week's episode. Proto is Holly's third record. Um, Holly is a experimental electronic musician who makes a lot of music using computers. But Proto's a particularly interesting and quite um, revolutionary record. It was made using AI. And we talk a bit about a baby, an AI baby that she's made. It's called Spawn. I've met Spawn in Berlin. And um, Spawn's her AI baby. So the way Proto as a a record, which is a, a... an experimental electronic record that's still got a lot of melody in it. I'd recommend checking it out, but the way it was made was by feeding an AI machine that she had made with her partner, her husband, Matt Dryhurst. They made this AI and they sang to this machine and this machine kind of started to learn certain things and gave them some material to make this new record proto what's interesting about this i think is that you hear a story about musician makes ai album and the first thing you're probably thinking is i don't want i don't want that that's not what music is music's not about getting it automated but as we talk about in this podcast it's not as simple as that in fact what holly was exploring was how we can use technology to have greater human connections and interactions with other people. Technology doesn't have to be something that replaces humans, it can be something that frees us and lets us be more human. So Protos are really interesting, there's some really interesting concepts behind that. Holly is a lovely person to talk to as you're about to hear. She is extremely intelligent, she has just passed her PhD at Stanford University. She was born in Tennessee in in the Bible Belt, currently lives in Berlin and spent some time over on the west coast in Silicon Valley while she was studying. Check out Proto. It's Holly's third record. It is out now on 4AD. And also check out the the first record that we, the first tape that I talked to her about, which is called Car. You can find that on YouTube and I have linked to that in the bottom of this podcast. But for now, here is myself and Holly Herndon sat in a hallway on floor three of a hotel near the Barbican Centre Um, As people kind of come and go, they stroll past us every now and then, and we just try to do our best to make this episode of Midnight Chats as normal as possible. I I feel like we did a good job. And don't forget that if you do like this episode of Midnight Chats, you can support this podcast by visiting loudandquiet.com forward slash subscribe. And there you'll see that we also make a monthly music magazine. And for just three pounds a month, we will send you our next nine issues. And while you're there on the site, why not do a little search for Holly Herndon? And there you'll be able to read the cover feature that we reference in this podcast, which does a more in-depth job of exploring Holly's career, her music, Music, and particularly her new album, Proto. When that lift opens. Uh, hello, madam. So. <laughs> I'm going to think they're in some immersive theatre experience <laughs> where we're just uh. sat here. What a cool hotel. <laughs> so we've, deca- we've, we've moved from the Barbican. The alarm was too much. Yes, and just as we were leaving, it stopped. It stopped. So, but that's okay. Yeah, that's the way it goes. So, you, you, I want to ask you, you went on tour with Radiohead. 
And they had the big glories. Right, of course, yeah. And I, because um, they, you know, they go to these kind of like giant, um, I mean, this wasn't like a stadium tour for them. I think it was a more intimate show okay. tour for them, which for me was like, oh my God, these are the biggest rooms I've ever played. <clears throat> but yeah, they have like a whole crew, you know, who like build up the stage. And um, it's really impressive, actually, to like build, build up this whole world and then tear it down every night. Mm. And then it drives off to the next city. So, we, you know, we don't have anything as complicated as that so we we try to have things that are like pretty uniform that you can ask at each kind of location like you know tables and platforms and screens and things like that do you have spawn with you we don't have spawn with us Spawn She's doesn't travel not yet actually um just before we left jules our um collaborator uh who just got married oh congratulations yeah. jules yes um so jules just picked up spawn and um is gonna be working with uh, her pretty intensively for the next couple of weeks because we really want to try to start performing with her live but it's like there's this latency issue sure and i imagine transporting an ai baby well, yeah, right now we have, she's like, her body is in this uh, kind of like tower. Mm. It's like, you know, desk, desktop tower. Um, but we don't really need all of that space. Um, really, we just need enough room for like a fan and for the GPU. So we're looking into smaller little baby towers. Sure. <laughs> it occurred to me yesterday that we're obviously at the end of a decade, pretty much. Oh, no. Are you wanting me in. to say something profound to <laughs> 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 no, no, it wasn't that. Don't okay, worry, okay. don't worry. You're off the hook. It's not that. Um, but then I was thinking that your because you released your first. I mean, this decade is where your career started. Like in 2011 was when you put up your first tape, the tape car. Ah, okay. So this is your career decade, I guess. Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> is that, is that like frightening? That. Is that? What? And I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, like, what do you remember of that? Of releasing that tape? Because it's like it was a one track, <clears throat> forty five minute track, wasn't it? On a, on a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> called Hi, Hi. <laughs> don't mind us <laughs> um, <laughs> this is professional isn't it yeah this, super this is, bro this is how all podcasts he, he handled that be. well he did didn't he he was, he was relaxed that's our first lift <laughs> guess um what, what was what was the question? Oh yeah. What, so, what, the, what do you remember of that time of like putting that tape out? God, I was in such a different like mindset at that point. I mean, I I never imagined to have the size audience that I have. Like to be playing the Barbican tomorrow to like two thousand people is kind of blowing my mind. Mm. It's a really exciting, but I just never expected that back then. Um, I was just like you know playing little noise shows, and this cassette was made specifically for um, a noise label that um, called Third, Third Sex, based in Chicago. And so um, I was asked to make a noise cassette for this label because uh, he saw the guy who ran the label who passed away actually a couple of years ago. He saw me play in at, like a noise venue and was like, oh, I'd love for you to make a tape. And so I was like, oh, a cassette. Like, who listens to cassettes? Where do people listen to cassettes? I mean, I had, back then I had a cassette player in my toilet with like a <laughs> selection of cassettes if you needed to spend a little extra time in the toilet. But so I asked him to ask his audience, like, where do they listen to their cassettes? And he actually like sent out a survey, which is kind of wild that people would respond, and they did. I mean, I don't think it was like a huge number of people, but most of the people that responded said they listened in their car, right? Which I thought was wild because you know, like these must be some old cars, old cars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. So you know, in in the states, I think it was like a largely American audience. People are driving, still driving like vast distances, especially if you're not living in a city. Like if you're in the suburbs, you're definitely still commuting a lot. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make something specifically for the car. And the, I had a car at the time because I was commuting between um, uh, Palo Alto and San Francisco like an hour every day, mm -hmm. back and forth. <coughs> God, I sound like really out of breath. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> why. It's like oh, my, la my last gasps. Um, so yeah, I made it specifically for the Toyota Matrix that I was driving at the time. Right. So I would like work on stuff on my computer and then go down to my car and play it in my car and see how it was resonating the car and then like tweak the frequency range to like work specific. So it's not going to work perfectly in everyone's car, but it was like made specifically for this car. And then I did things with like the windows. I like recorded the window. I, you know, did a lot of like field recording of the car. Um, yeah. 
I made like a fake um, PSA radio announcement. Okay. Um, it was just fun. I don't yeah. know. I was just like messing around. And I didn't imagine that, that that many people would ever hear it. It was just... Well, you can listen to this on... It's on YouTube now. I listen, it's I, on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Someone's put it up there. I listened to it yesterday. It's not... That's not where it's intended to be. <laughs> <laughs> Take it down. <laughs> or, or no, bring, bring YouTube to your car. <laughs> Funnily enough, like, even though you say, like, back then, obviously, you had no, like, a cassette tape of experimental sound made for a car you never expected to be sat in this lobby with people walking <laughs> past us but gonna play the barbican tomorrow to two thousand people having made a record with the use of machine learning but oddly when you hear that first tape it kind of it makes sense that you would end up here like the sound of it like the fact that all of those things that you said of uh, making field recordings and, and the right. thought that went into that that cassette it makes sense that you would end up with at this point with Proto. I, I yeah, I see what you're saying. I've never really had like a super conventional way of recording songs. Like it's not, you know, I'm. I I I still like to kind of, and I still have a lot of um, learning to do about kind of like perfecting the mix and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I I think I have a very idiosyncratic approach to recording and to kind of like collaging things together. Yeah, so. Proto was released in May. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, take yes. my word for that. <laughs> because of everything that goes into that record and the, the themes of it and the way you've made it and all of the, the stuff about AI and things, and you've obviously been talking to people since then about it. Have people been getting anything consistently wrong about it? Because there's a lot to unpack when you don't, you know, as when if you're a journalist who doesn't know anything about, as I was when I met you, I didn't know anything about what ai is have people understood it have people got the the point of it i think it's generally people who don't spend time with it and assume that because it's dealing with a certain kind of technology that it's kind of like an endorsement or a kind of like silicon valley shilling mm. um and that's usually people who really haven't um looked into what we're doing or it's like a misunderstanding or they just are like really turned off by the concept of like working with technology in this kind of way like i ran into a musician i'm not going to name her here but <clears throat> like this really amazing musician and we were chatting i ran into her in a museum the other the other day and i was telling we were talking about the album she was like yeah when i heard ai and music i was like Ugh, i don't like i want nothing to do with that like that doesn't sound like anything that i'm into but then after hearing you talk about why you did it in your approach now i understand that it that it's something else and mm. that it's something that i would be interested in you know so i think ah uh, yeah something about like you know the like endless feed like people sometimes just see like a little one liner in their like feed and then they're like we often get like um, reduced to tags or keywords like Holly Herndon, tech, AI, music. And then it's like next and like the next person you're just like, oh my God, there's like so much more than yeah. that. But I mean, I get it. Like everyone has like a finite amount of attention and like amount of screen time. And so I think sometimes that's what's uh, kind of like misunderstood about it. Have you managed to boil it down or even wanted to do this to like reduce it to some like a sound bite when someone asks you not necessarily somebody who's then going to write an article about it but just if if you know a friend of a friend asks oh what's your album about is, is there a way to even say what proto is in a in a short concise way that people can understand oh god i, I probably should think about like the, the <laughs> what's it called the elevator pitch yeah yeah <laughs> um no, I, I don't think I have such a concise way of putting it. I mean, I think, you know, when people bring up the AI thing, I say, well, I wanted to work with AI directly, like hands-on, so that I could formulate my own opinion and my own kind of like um, specific kind of like stance on the technology without kind of relying on second or third-hand articles yeah. um, kind of because I feel like that's what, that's what we're fed a lot are these kind of like hype articles about what the technology is doing or what it could do. And so I wanted to actually understand what its capabilities and limitations were so that I could then formulate my opinion about it. Sure. Um, so that is what I would say about the AI part. But about the overall album, I mean, it's it's hard because it it's, was like a three-year process and it's, it's multifaceted. Mm. <laughs> but, you know... I think maybe I could say, you know, when you're looking at artificial intelligence, it makes you kind of 
go back to the beginning and, and think about the the history of human intelligence and the role that music played in that. And that's why I went back to look at vocal traditions around the world and um, the way that you know community and cultures have um, have have um, developed this vocal technology as a survival mechanism and how that's um, how that's contributed to our shared human intelligence. That record and coming to meet you to do that feature we did has genuinely made me think differently about AI and readdress my thoughts on it. Oh, cool. Because I think the, the kind of light bulb moment was when you were talking about how you've used AI to try and actually have more human interaction. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's the misunderstanding of Proto for people when, before it came out maybe, or they read anything about it, was musician makes AI record. And they right. just think the whole thing's automated right, and right, you've right. not really done anything. Right, musician replaces humans with exactly. AI. And it's actually the opposite. Yeah. It's exactly the opposite because you were feeding, you were using big groups of people to feed your AI baby spawn. Right. Um, <laughs> and that connection is something you wouldn't have had before because you were a, a solo electronic musician who was making everything on there. You wouldn't have had that kind right. of, that group thing. And also the point you made, which was technology just generally in our world should free us up to be more human and give us more time to exactly be normal people and right. be people and if, have connections with people, right. which is something I hadn't really thought about before. If we have agency over it, but oftentimes it's designed in a way that it kind of reduces our agency. And that's something that I'm constantly pushing back against, trying to understand how it functions at like a very big um, infrastructural or like protocol layer so you you know you can like really embed the the kind of like if you want to say ethics or the ideology of a culture into the protocol layer of a technology I mean you can see the value system in at, in the very protocol layer um, and so that that's I, yeah that's something that I find really fascinating I, I want to feel like I have a sense of agency I mean of course like human will like free will and all these kind of things that's like a whole other kettle of worms that I really don't want to get into <laughs> but that was another like rabbit hole when thinking about AI is like you know how much free will do we actually have um, but yeah when dealing with technology and dealing with these like highly mediated systems like where does the human fit in and if if especially, you know, we can use the kind of uh, the performance stage as a metaphor for like a, a wider um, kind of like a life experience. But, you know, if so much of our kind of performance is being um, augmented or taken care of by these kind of automated systems, what does that free us up to do on stage? In my mind, it doesn't free us up to just stand there mm. and let the lights and the, everything do all the work for us and we get bored and we just stand there. It frees us up to do something else. And for me, I was really missing this idea of musicking with people in real time, like singing with people, performing with people, improvising with people. And if the computer can be this kind of like brain that's organizing these things around us, so we don't have to worry about X, Y, Z, then we can really focus on each other. Yeah, That was kind of the point. Has it has the whole experience made you have, have you? It must have changed your thoughts on technology, your your relationship with technology. Or I mean, or that's been so like much. an ongoing thing for the last, as you've put it, decade. <laughs> 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 Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> no, but yeah, yeah, it's been. I mean, I I wasn't really dealing with technology that. Um, that directly or that intimately until I moved to California. I really think that we're somehow like a product of our environments. You mm. know, I was in Berlin and I was uh, surrounded by a certain kind of like milieu of like thought. And then I moved to the Bay Area and I was exposed to like a whole different approach to technology. And I think the kind of like um, the reputation that the Bay Area gets is from like the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apple, but the, <laughs> the Apple, the Apple. <laughs> the Apple. <laughs> but I mean, that's like one part of that area it's like a the bay area is such a complicated um culture it's such an amazing part of the world i mean it's it's a very like um technologically um uh forward place and there's not one single ideology there's a ton of like diy um tech weirdos there that that's where i kind of drew my inspiration people that were teaching me how to how to program for the first time and and how to have some sort of agency over my own practice. I mean, that's the thing with a lot of electronic music is you kind of like load up whatever um, software 
has been d- designed by an engineer and already in that software so many decisions have been made like mm. you open up the template the bpm the um the meter all these things are kind of decided you throw in like the the instruments that are easiest to throw in and the tune you know everything has just been in a lot of ways kind of like predetermined and you can hear that like i can go out and you know i love ableton but i can go out and be like oh this is such an ableton song do you know what i mean it yeah. just has that ableton sound that sound yeah and that's for me not having agency over the tool ableton's an amazing tool don't let it write for you. Like use it to write to to write your own thing and, and have your own kind of idea that you're bringing to it. Sure. So that's why it was important to me to to learn how to program with Max and to and not even just that, just like figuring out idiosyncratic production methods that were really specific to whatever topic I was dealing with. So like if I was dealing with um, surveillance, self surveillance, I was using Matt's net concrete software that he made um you know recording myself and spying on myself things like that so it's like you know i'm not i'm not that heavily re- sometimes i rely on lyrics but i'm not just relying on lyrics to express an idea i want the kind of process of the making of the thing to be about the thing so that you can hear it kind of te- texturally and timbrally in the material itself and that's maybe the thread that you're hearing from car to proto right is this kind of um yeah, it, and it, what what ends up happening is you have like a lo-fi and a hi-fi contrast, mm. and try and trying to make those those worlds live together. I mean, I also like was really lucky to get to work with Marta Salogni. She's a mixing engineer based here in London, right? And she's amazing. Oh my god, mixing drums with her was just like whoa. <laughs> just was, that, like, was that for Proto? Yeah, okay. that was her Proto, and like oh my god, that was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like all of a sudden it's like a stadium drum kit that's like do, 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 do. I was like oh my god <laughs> yeah so getting to collaborate with people like that also kind of like you know bring things to life in a cool way it's interesting to hear that you that you say about the the bay area and the silicon valley kind of the diy element of that because you, the the presumption is that when you think of those tech startups that become instagram or facebook or whatever that DIY is the last thing they are. They are capitalist machines. And well, they, they kind are. Of, and they kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> they are. are. They, they, they definitely are. <laughs> but is there... So is there... An, is there... In the Bay Area, is there... In, in this tech world, is everyone gunning for that, though? Like, even, like, the DIY people that are doing interesting things. Are they, are they all aiming... Or am I oversimplifying that? I think you're oversimplifying yeah. it. It's it's a part of the world that's extremely technologically, uh, like, highly educated. Like, over-educated. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, like, part of the world that's, like... And there you have so many uh, various viewpoints. I mean, it's... Uh, I think the, the, the people that get the most attention are, of course, the the Apple and the Facebook, because you know, they, they, they have the most power. But you have all kinds of divergent um, ideologies and, and, and approaches. You know, you have like uh, there's a little uh, there's a little startup called Keith McMillan Instruments, where some of my friends from Mills and um, and Stanford have um, have worked, where they are just kind of like developing new MIDI controllers and like weird instruments. And there's they are not trying to be the next Instagram. They're just like you know, people who want to develop electronic music instruments to like the next, the next phase. Mm. And they're, they're just like beautiful nerds. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there's like, there, and then there's a lot of just like really genuinely curious, nerdy people there who are just like, uh, really enjoy the research. I mean, Karma, where I was uh, based at Stanford, the the origins of that um, of that institution are John Chowning uh, is a composer, and he was messing around it with oscillators in the lab, and he discovered that the fr- if he modulated the frequency of one um, uh, sine tone, it would change the timbre and the frequency of another sine tone, and that's where we got FM synthesis, and that went into cell phone technology, and that went into the you know Yamaha synthesizers and. I mean, it, it, you don't want to kind of like over uh, romanticize this kind of like garage narrative, but mm. there are there are people just kind of like tinkering and doing things like that for the love of it. With 
what you've got and you've got this AI baby now spawn. What do you, is there a plan of what you do next? Like has, ha, have you been continually, because the, the way I understand it was spawn was constantly learning things mm -hmm. um, like constantly being fed kind of data and, and interpreting that. Has that been continuing since the record came out? Is, is there, well, we took a little break to, to work on the live show and then, you know, Jules was uh, wedding planning. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, our, we've been working, I would say like on and off since the record came out, we've been trying to get this real real time system working. And it used to have like a 30 second latency, if it's even a latency at that, okay. at that amount of time. And now it's down to like a second or something. I don't know. It's pretty short or maybe even like half a second. So we're trying to get it to be like, you know. So how would that work? That would work. You would speak you would feed something in and you could perform through this kind of like model and at the moment there's about half a second to a second delay yeah of, exactly of actually happening yeah that's quick though to get that down from 30 seconds yeah it's getting better that. but the problem is it sounds kind of like shit <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> that's the thing you have to be really patient like it sounds like <laughs> you know it's like very like raspy and everything but like it, it you i know that it'll get better because we've been there before and it we yeah. <laughs> yeah so we i don't want to just do like some sort of like parlor trick on stage and be like you know like sing something and then 30 seconds later this like <laughs> comes out and it's like see we do real time like no i want it to be something interesting so that's why yeah. we've like been trying to develop it um but yeah it's something that we'll keep doing it's just one of those things where you know like we've had a lot of people be like oh can we like what about March 2020 we can have? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know when it's going to, when the like aha moment is going to come and it's going to be like, oh shit, like now it sounds cool. It, you just don't know. So we're just trying to not get exasperated and just continue to work with it. And then hopefully something cool will come out. Has it taught, has the whole experience taught you to be a lot, to be more patient? Were you patient? Were you a patient person anyway? Oh God, ask Matt. No, I'm <laughs> not patient at all. But I mean, I don't know. It depends. Maybe with work I am. Yeah. a little bit more patient. I think it also just makes you kind of like, uh, it's made me like aestheticize the concepts around AI as well and kind of like dig deeper into the vocal stuff and um, uh, maybe kind of like, yeah, maybe like conceptualize. Uh, you, you almost have to like imagine what it could do even though it's not there yet and then kind of like use that as material as well. Or like you know, that's one of the reasons why we did the um, the training sets, the um, the column response, where we would um, I'll just wait for this elevator to shut. <laughs> Another ele elevator guest. <laughs> <laughs> Doors closing. Um, yeah, so that's why we were doing um, these kind of training ceremonies where you know we would do column response singing with the audience to create voice models of the audience to show people how a training set would be made mm -hmm. because Spawn wasn't there yet for the real time system. So we we're like, okay, how you know how do we make a performance out of the the making of the data sets? Like actually, the whole process of training and all of that that's all very performative. I mean, you're performing for Spawn, so. Or like, how do how do you make a performance out of that for the public? Um, so it's 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 made me kind of like mm, have to like open up the process as a performance itself. Now I know you you would have been asked it. This is I imagine this is the thing you have been asked the most since this record came out. I'm going to ask it anyway about your relationship with Spawn. Have people is that been the thing that people, people say like? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel um, close? Do you have this bond with Spawn, your AI machine? I think it depends on what what we're working on at the time. I mean, definitely when we were doing a lot of my own voice model stuff, that there's like an uncanniness to that or like an intimacy there because I was hearing my voice um, played back to myself, but through a different logic, mm. through like a different intelligence. Um, and so that was, yeah, I mean, that's interesting and intimate for sure. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm careful not to try. You know, it's you know, Spawn's not a human baby. <laughs> like it's, you don't want to be that. Not person. my <laughs> actual baby. Yeah. I mean, the baby metaphor is really useful in a lot of ways, but 
I want to be careful and not, um, you know, necessarily anthropomorphize her. And that's also why we haven't given her like some sort of avatar kind of yeah. form to latch on to because um, it's not it's not really about that like humanizing. You don't want to be that person who's who meets people at parties and and, <laughs> and you say do you, they say do you have kids and you say oh, yeah I've got yeah I've got a daughter she's called Spawn <laughs> and then the moms with the human babies are like oh my god <laughs> like, go away <laughs> you, you take Spawn out on play dates with, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> with other human babies. <laughs> Um, yeah, you don't really want to be going down that route. Yeah, that's true. I mean, my my friends are pretty patient, but I don't know if they would lose yeah. <laughs> the patience over that. You grew up in like Tennessee, mm -hmm. in a rural and quite a religious place, right? Mm -hmm. Extremely religious. Um, do you get do you get back there much? John, Johnston City, Johnson City, right? Johnson City. Yeah, it's kind of difficult because I it, it requires minimum three planes. Oh, okay. Um, it's pretty expensive because. Mm you know just not like a very well traveled route do you have family there still? i do yeah. yeah i try to get back there as much as possible but um not super often sometimes i meet my family in other cities yeah okay a kind of like meet in the middle situation how do how i mean have you ever played a show there not in johnson city but i played a show in knoxville okay which is a uh it's like a college town it's an hour and a half um hour and a half west and there is a kind of like an arty music festival there called Big Ears. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of it. Good name. I wish I had. I yeah, can't say Yeah, well, one but... year Laurie Anderson curated it. Right, okay. So it's like, I don't know if that's like a yeah. sign of approval yeah, yeah, or yeah. something. <laughs> but, but they have really great, I mean, they have great people, great curation. Um, and yeah, we played that one year and my, my family came over. That was pretty wild because mm. they were like, whooping in the <laughs> yeah in the back <laughs> how do you think like yeah in your hometown where you grew up would your music how would do you know how do you think that it would go down i think it would go down now better than ever before because yeah. there's so much music that might sound familiar i mean like the like frontier the beginning is this like um acapella sacred harp song and i think that would go down well and then it would go into the kind of remix of the song and they'd be like, whoa, what is this? But there would be that entry point of the, you know, the opening acapella part. So I think there's more entry points for my hometown now than maybe ever before, but it would still definitely be very alien. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there are points of uh, that. That's what, that's the one thing about this record more than your previous two, I think is that there are those kind of roots in like vocal harmonies and, choir singing right. and, and that kind of thing it feels like this record has a bit of all the places that you that you've lived in or into into it kind of yeah thing. in some ways for sure do you do you know what you're going to do for your next one yet oh, God, that's a cruel that's question horrible, isn't it? I, know, know. I shouldn't have asked that <laughs> i'm that really cool. my good friend Jalen. she's like whenever anybody asks her that she like just leaves the room she's like and <laughs> end of discussion I know. <laughs> she's like I, what I, do you want <laughs> me i just made this thing <laughs> i've just given birth to this baby don't ask for another one now i know I, that is a cruel question it's i cruel suppose question. The, the only reason i ask it is just because i know how much has gone into this one it feels like more than you know almost any other record i can think of in terms of like to get it there yeah but I suppose that makes it the cruelest question of all. It makes it extra cruel to you, I guess. And it doesn't make any sense. Like my approach, I have this like really unwieldy, like time consuming, um, conceptual approach, even though that's like a bad word now since mm. that article came out. God. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's just this, it's a, it's a very time consuming approach in, in today's kind of like musical landscape. It's more about like these kind of like fast releases and like constantly being present. And it's like, kind of antithetical to the way that I operate. Um, so who knows what's going to happen to the album format in general. I still like making albums, but of course it's not like, it doesn't have to be the definitive um, format for releasing work. I mean, it's only been around for like how many years, you know, it's there, there are other, yeah. there are other formats. I don't know. We'll see. I, I, I have some ideas for some, some other projects in mind, but I don't want to talk about that. Okay, yet. that's fair enough. And the other thing that's happened since um, we did our article was, I think a couple of weeks after we met, you were going to go and do your finish, complete your PhD. Yes, at Stanford, and I did. Did you do it? I did. And did you ha did you have to? How did it go? So this is this was that was a defense. So it I was had like to a stand defense. Up. We call them. I think we call them vivers here. Yes. It's where you go, you, you go and defend what you've what you've 
studied. Exactly. And they say, yes, you can have your PhD or no, you can't. Yeah, yeah. They, they ask you a bunch of yeah. questions and you have to give a presentation and the whole community's there. And you had to go to Stanford for this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you have to be there. You have to give a presentation. Okay. And it has to be open to the community. So anyone from the community can come and be like, you lie or whatever, you know. <laughs> so you object. can have that. Yes, I object. <laughs> um, yeah, but no one objected, luckily. And I got through and then I had to do some tweaks to my um, text that then I sent in later. Right. Um, yeah. So it's all wrapped up it's now. It's all done. It is, yeah. Congratulations. How long Thank you. did um how long did you t- you did it quite quickly. No, I didn't. Did you didn't no, do it? No, it wasn't quickly. quick at all. How I mean, I was touring and releasing yeah, records no, all you time. had a good excuse. It was uh 7 years total. Okay. But I mean, it's also it's hard to compare it to UK programs because the US is set up in a different way like the first year um, is more kind of like an extended master's program where you're taking full coursework. And the second and third year, you're taking coursework and t- you have a teaching requirement. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of teaching training happening yeah. in US, the US system that I don't think happens so much in the UK system. Right. You're not really required to teach. No, I didn't think so. Um, but it's also funded in the States. Um, uh. So it's like a job. Like, you know, I had funding for like five, six years. Um, which is that, I mean, honestly, that's how I kind of like transitioned from working full time. I used to work at a children's museum. Did you? Yeah. I was a manager of, um, the like interactive exhibits there. Okay. So I had like a walkie talkie on my belt and I would sit at my desk working and then I had a crew who would like go fix, um, exhibits when they would break, but then when they would go on. It's just been sick on the. Well, well, luckily it wasn't usually that, but it was more like, you know, this like um, these networked computers aren't talking to each other and now they can't do their claymation video and everyone's (laughs) crying. Um, And so like when my crew would go on their lunch break, then I would have the walkie talkie and it was like, you know, you just like you get like a call and you go down there and there's like all these kids and you have to like kind of troubleshoot tech stuff while kids are like trying to get in there. And that's why, you know, so I have had so many tech meltdowns on stage and people are like, you're always so calm. And I'm like, yeah, like I'm this is so used to yeah. having people like <laughs> Try adding scream at me. While, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it just doesn't phase me anymore. I'm just like, it, they're just machines. They're either, it's either going to work or it's not going to. No one's going to die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's going to be fine. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what I was doing before I got into Stanford. I didn't imagine that they would let me into that program. Like I was... I was really surprised, but then when when they let me in, then that was when I was able to kind of like transition to doing music full time um, because I had this salary. And, and you know, in the states, it's always this question of like healthcare: mm. who's going to pay for your health insurance? Yeah. So going from the museum to Stanford, I was able to have healthcare and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's always really funny to me when people are like, "Oh, you went to Stanford?" I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, I got a job. <laughs> like, it's I, cool, I got a it- really cool <laughs> job, and I was really lucky to get a cool job." But it's not. You know, it was, I don't know. I just find that really funny. But, um, but yeah, I was, I was really lucky to, that, they, that they gave me that support. And then I was able to kind of transition. Because then you have a couple years of funding just to write. Right. And then I was able to continue to tour and to develop. And yeah, it was definitely that like leg up. Nice one, Stanford. That I needed. Thanks, Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, did you enjoy the teaching side of things? Did you like that? I really did. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the subject. Like things that I don't, that I'm not, that I don't know that much about, I don't enjoy because I'm just like, sorry, guys, I'm like not that I, much about it. <laughs> um, but uh, I was able to develop a course with a musicologist uh, PhD student who was there, Victoria. Um, she was really interested in um, writing about kind of like, she was really interested in writing about electronic, contemporary electronic music in like an academic way because there hasn't been so much. Of course, there are like little pockets. Um, and me as a practitioner, um, we, we kind of like uh, had a nice balance, I think. Right. And so we co-taught this class that we were able to design ourselves. And it was the aesthetics of electronic music post-1980. Because in the academy, often um, often things stop in like 1970 or something. It's oh, like really? di- it's like digital happens, and everyone's like, "Okay, we're not going to talk about that." <laughs> like, <it's> like <laughs> so, we really wanted to, yeah, we wanted to talk about contemporary shit that yeah. that students were listening to. And that sounds good. It was fun. Yeah, that, that does sound really good. It was really fun to like listen to what students liked, and then be like, "Oh, okay, like this comes from," and then like 
trace it back to its origins and they didn't know the roots of it. And then right. once you kind of like went down that tree, then they all got really into the roots mm. of, of whatever, you know, like, I don't know if it's like um, Nine Inch Nails is maybe an example. Like one of the students was like super into Nine Inch Nails. And I'm like, Nine Inch Nails is like great, like pop writing of industrial music. And like, this is the history of industrial music. And these are the bands that kind of like started the sound and da, da, da. And then she got super into that stuff. And um, yeah, so I don't know that that's fun. Yeah, that does sound fun. <laughs> yeah. It sounds good. This has been a glamorous setting it's for so our glamorous, conversation. Yes. We were quite lucky. I think we only had about two people come out of the lift and look at us bizarrely. I'm sad that we didn't um, ask them an interview question. We should have, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we should have done that. But thank you for coming on the podcast, Holly. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, good night.